So I think it'd be awesome for you to take me and, and the listeners through kind of your analysis of one of these fairy tales. So pick one of the fairy tales that you like the best and give us sort of the deep read on it. In, yeah, in, we, could, in, we could pick Jack. I think Jack is a, is a good example because also we just published the, we're just publishing the newest version. And Jack's fun because the thing about Jack is at the outset, it looks ridiculous. Like it's really difficult to, uh, to, to see what the connection. Since I was a child, I love that story. But I was always wondering like, how do we get from these different parts of the story to the others, right? But it's actually, once you kind of understand it, it's actually quite, it's deeply coherent. Uh, and so, like a lot of the stories, Jack is of coming of age story at the out, at the outset, right? There is, and this is also the thing that's difficult about a lot of Puritan interpretation of fairy tales, is they try to get rid of the coming of age and sometimes sexual imagery that's in, that's in the fairy tale. By doing that, they miss a whole part of it. Now the other part, like the, the more progressive types, let's say in the 20th century, have tried to emphasize just sexuality. But that's also wrong. It's both. Just like in the Bible, there's a bunch of sexual symbolism. But it's not just about sex. It's about how sexuality can show us a deeper meaning and a deeper, deeper participation. So you see that in Jack. So basically, Jack doesn't have a father. And his mother's poor. Right. And so she's the poor woman. She's the widow in the story of Elijah. She she's someone who doesn't have uh, she doesn't have anything coming from heaven, to, you know, to to make give her an identity and to, to hold her together. And so Jack has to trade the cow. He has to trade the feminine for seed. And it happens about at the time that he's at that age where that's going to happen to him, where he's going to kind of leave his mother. His body's going to develop. He's going to discover masculinity. And that's and so but it's magic seed. Uh, you know, but ma seeds are magic in themselves. Like it's, they don't even have to be magic seeds. They're, se they're the difference between a cow that gives you milk and seeds that you can plant in the ground. And then they, they give you a whole bunch of food forever if you're able to do it right. So that's what's going on in that story. He plants the seeds at night and he wakes up with a giant beanstalk. There is a little bit of a sexual illusion there about him discovering masculinity. Uh, he climbs the beanstalk and then he encounters a giant. And so in encountering the giant, he basically encounters the problem of masculinity, the problem of hierarchy, the idea of trying to integrate a world of masculinity when you're, when you're coming of age. If anybody knows that, you try to, you have to, you have to, when you try to come, join a team or you have to do anything, you have to prove yourself and the other men are giants to you, right? Um, so then, but he has a problem, his mother's poor, and that's one of the problems that he's trying to deal with, the poor, the, the poor mother. And so he finds a bag of gold, he steals that from the giant, brings it to his mother. You think the problem solved, right? He found a bag of gold, solved the problem, but then the gold runs out. So what's better than gold, right? What's better than gold is the way you make gold. If you can produce gold, then it's much better than gold. So he goes back up and he gets a chicken that lays golden eggs. He's reached a higher level of understanding, like a higher pattern of masculinity, a higher pattern of civilization, just a higher pattern of how the world functions, brings that down to his, his mother. But again, that's so, not enough, it seems. He has to find something else. And then when he goes back up, the last thing he finds is a harp, that, a golden harp that plays music. So you think, what the hell? Like, what is the relationship between the gold the chicken that lays gold down and the, and the harp. But it's once you understand that what he's getting from heaven is something like patterns. He's getting patterns of being. So you think of Moses that goes up the mountain, right? What does he get when he gets to the top? He gets at the top. He gets a pattern of being. That's what the law is. He gets a pattern of space. That's what the pattern of the tabernacle is. And so this is what he's getting. He's getting patterns of being. And now he gets the highest pattern. For all intents and purposes, he gets what... Uh, you know, what we call the music of the spheres. Basically, the pattern of everything is what he's attaining, right? The logos itself, if you want to use another type of language. And so he steals that from his mother, and then he comes back down, and then he cuts the, he cuts the beanstalk, and the, the beanstalk falls. And so now he's gotten from heaven, but it's a, it's a weird Promethean story. It's actually a little suspicious because he's stealing these things from heaven. So there's something of a Promethean element to what he's doing, which is he's going into, into up Mount Olympus and he's stealing the fire from the gods and bringing them to earth. And so this is, the, this is you know, once you kind of understand, you can see that it's totally coherent. It makes sense with a lot of the Bible stories. It makes sense with the ancient myths. Um, and that it's a gray story, actually, because Jack is a thief who goes into heaven to steal knowledge from the gods, basically. Uh, and so in our version, what we do is we, I play with that, where I use reference the idea of the fallen angels and the fallen giants. 
and this this idea that in some ways there's something suspicious about what he's doing, although we all it's, we all tend to do that, but there's something suspicious about it. I mean, one, one of the things that's fascinating about what you're doing in, in re-examining these fairy tales, it demonstrates how they can also be emptied of, of all meaning. So you mentioned that the, the early Disney fairy tales are replete with tremendous darkness. I mean, if you watch the original Snow White from Disney, it is incredibly dark. I mean, if you show it to your kids, this was rated G. People were scared in the theaters. Kids were crying. Like, it's, it, it's a real thing. And now, because we basically have said that, that children should never experience anything that scares them uh, or, or that upsets them, it, many parents will never show their kids uh, any, anything like the old Disney movies. The old Disney movies, again, if you watch Pinocchio, Pinocchio is scary as hell. I mean, it, truly, it is, it is frightening. I mean, there are children turning into donkeys and being caged forever. I mean, it's, it's, it's really, really scary. And, and then you fast forward to kind of the fairy tales as they're retold today. And now it's all kind of the same theme. Uh, it's, also, it's always some young girl who is becoming self-empowered uh, and uh, never really has to face a villain. It turns out there really isn't a villain. There's just somebody who's sort of misunderstood. Yeah, uh, right. and, uh, and, and then eventually everybody, you know, it, it, it all comes out right in the end because she's found her, her inner sense of, of confidence. And then, and then the world is, is somehow a better place. And that's, that's the story of pretty much every single one of the Disney fairy tales for the last 10 years. So you can see the transition in American life in, in how these fairy tales are told. Yeah, and you're totally right. Not only that, but there is a type of arrogance, which is that we're going to transform the fairy tales, we're going to twist them, we're going to change them into something that's ideologically aligned with what we want. But the truth is that the fairy tales are not ideological at all. They offer a full story, and you can see different aspects of humanity in these fairy tales, and they, they, they're they not political in the, the base sense, right? You know, it's about really deep relationships of a children to, to hierarchy, about how, you know, how to integrate the world and how to be excluded from the world, all of these really powerful and important statements. Like the, you know, the, we can see that Disney is, they don't know what to do with Snow White. They just don't know what to do with it. They're stuck because they don't understand it, first of all. And then they think they understand it because they think it's all, it's all about patriarchy and about politics. Uh, but they don't understand how it is a coming of age story of a young girl. And that young girls in the real world, coming of age also means encountering someone with which they're going to found a family. Without that, you, you, the world runs out of people. Like if it's just about empowering yourself and being independent, then you don't, then the world runs out of people in the end. Yeah, I mean, that, that is one of the amazing things that again, I, I think that the, the left-wing political ethos has taken over so many of these stories. The, my, my favorite example in terms of sort of the Disney arc, and again, I'm an old Disney fan, huge Disney fan. It makes me really sad to the core of my being how Disney has destroyed its own IP and, and really screwed itself up as a company on behalf of politics. My favorite sort of compare contrast here is the difference between the Jiminy Cricket Pinocchio, always let your conscience be your guide, which is literally a line from the movie. I mean, the entire story of Pinocchio is that the boy who's coming of age refuses to let his conscience be his guide. He has to explore every bad idea. And then finally, he learns that responsibility on behalf of protecting his own family and his father is actually the way that you become a real boy, right? The way that you actually mature in the world is to take on responsibility and duty and act with conscience as opposed to going to Pleasure Island, right? I mean, like the, the, the thematic could not be clearer in the original Pinocchio. And you take that and then you contrast that with the immorality of the, the most popular song of the last 20 years from Disney, Let It Go, which is entirely about, there, there's literally a line in there that, that says, no right, no wrong, no rules, I'm free. Which, yeah. is, which is about as pagan as an ethos as is possible to find. You can see the arc of American morality in, a, in about 60 years right there. Yeah, exactly. And I think, I think you're right. And that's why they don't know what to do with the fairy tales, because the fairy tales just don't, they don't play that game. There are deep reflections of reality that have been built up over millennia, you know, and we have to take, treat them with respect. And because if not, they're going to turn against us, you know. And even what happens is that when you twist the fairy tales, you end up saying things that you don't even know you're saying because you don't even understand the the let's say the how fraught it is to play with these with these patterns and to just kind of twist them as you want and it'll turn against us you know like i said the the idea of people don't realize that the idea of the self-made person you know that is not how that is not how civilization functions we need we need each other and so if you think it's r ridiculous that the princess ends with the prince or that a movie ends with a marriage it's like that's how the world functions. That's how the world works. If you just want to explore your own personal desires and doing doing that, you're not going to. You're basically going. It's an anti-human stance, and it leads anti-human results. I mean, that, that that that's exactly right. And if you, if you look back to 
you know, all if you look back to Shakespeare, which is sort of a, a you know a toned up version of of fairy tales. I mean, yeah. all, all of his comedies are essentially uh, a form of fairy tale, and every single one of them ends with a marriage, right? Every single one of Shakespeare's comedies ends with a wedding at the at the very end, because that's what that's why life is funny. Life is funny because all these bad things happen, and then the generations move on. You get married, and you build a thing, and and the, and and the, and with a tragedy, everyone dies at the end, right? Death is a tragedy because. They actually, you, you have not fulfilled your function of passing it on to the next generation. And usually in, in the tragedies, it's not just an old person dying. It's the young person dying that's the real tragedy. The end of Lear isn't Lear, Lear's death, really. The end, of, the end of Lear is Cordelia's death. And, and, and that's, that's true throughout all of the stories of, of the West is this importance on the deepest things. And because we have become a sterile civilization, and, and I wonder you know, how much of that is connected to the sterility of, of rationality. You know, I, I really pride myself on rationality. I love reason. Reason's great. Logic is great. But the truth is that the things that people tie themselves to are, in fact, beyond reason. And that's one of the things that, that you are really very much focused on is, is the fact that the things that people most believe in are not, in fact, the things they can reason out. It's the stuff that's sort of pre-rational. Yeah. Well, one of the things I've been arguing now for a decade is that there is a relationship between the excess of rationality and the excess of desire, that those two things actually kind of happen at the same time. So when you look at the Enlightenment, you have the Enlightenment move right away. And then right in the shadow of that, you have Marquis de Sade and Sasser Mazuk, like you have sadomasochism and, and, and sadism, uh, sadism and masochism happening right at the outset of the Enlightenment. And there's this sense in which if you don't have something that unites them together, and if you don't have something that transcends reason and emotion or reason and desires that kind of unites them, then they're going to separate. And at the outset, you can start with just reason, but then that collapses into just desire. And that's what we've seen. We see this weird pendulum even happening in our society, where on the one hand, you see these systems of absolute control being set up by states and not just states, but something beyond states. And at the same time, this worship of complete idiosyncrasy and like complete uh, personal uh, self-made self self-identification and my identity my identity is actually my desire it's not even anything that 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 holds me together it's just whatever whim I have but those two things actually interestingly go together uh, you need you need something to hold identity uh, reason and emotion or reason and desire into the transcendent